Hey everyone, uh, I'm Kevin Dierendorf and uh, here to talk to everyone today about Toho's history of kaiju, um, tokusatsu, horror stuff on television as opposed to the movies that we are all so used to seeing. So uh, just as a, as a quick explanation of why we're doing what we're doing, um, I found that generally speaking, the uh, the tokusatsu fandom is kind of divided into two bubbles. You have the people that really like TV shows, and those are usually you know superhero things from Toei, and then you have the people that like movies, and they're usually monsters and disaster films and horror things, and those are usually from Toho, and never the twain shall meet. But I'm all about building bridges between people, so I'm gonna just kind of talk today about where these two might intersect, and if you're a fan of one and you're kind of looking to get into the other, then you may want to start with some of those things in, in the middle there. So as a kind of uh, a, a primer here, we'll just kind of go through everything chronologically. So we'll start way back at the beginning of television in Japan. Uh, TV was a little bit uh, more delayed compared to the US because of World War II, because everything progress-wise in Japan was halted because of World War II. And um, they really didn't get their first permanent TV channels until 1953 when we got two of them, uh, NHK and Nippon Television. Um, that said, even though there was TV, it didn't mean that there were necessarily scripted dramas uh, to the extent that we uh, expect today, uh, because you know most of the programs that we uh, were getting um, on television in the early days were done live. So you kind of either do it as a stage show or a new show or a variety show, something like that. Uh, a big revelation comes out in 1958 when Japan is introduced to videotape. So this isn't domestic videotape that you have at your home, but sort of a broadcast tape. So with that, you can have a show that is pre-recorded and all easy, ready to go in a nice little compact box, and you can just plug it in and, and play it for broadcast. And because of that, all of a sudden you get a huge uptake in the number of dramas that are available to the consumers of uh, television. So the first special effects show is uh, Toei's uh, Gecko Kamen or Moonlight Mask in 1958. And that sort of kicks off a little boom of similar superhero shows that appear on TV, but it's Toei that's really leading the charge on that. Um, one of the uh, superhero shows in 1959 is uh, Tetsuan Adam or uh, better known as Astro Boy. This was a live action show, but in 1963, they decided to redo it for television in this crazy idea to do animation on television. They were gonna call it anime, and it turns out that that really took off. Uh, so Japan, uh, you know, there was a, a slow uptake in the adoption of television. Eventually, um, color was introduced in 1960, and then the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, really, that was when a lot of people are like, oh man, I haven't gotten a TV yet, but now I really gotta, gotta do that. Toho was not, totally on the ground floor when it came to, to TV dramas, but uh, they were pretty early adopters. They first made a TV drama in 1959, uh, uh, Tonma Tengu, which is a parody of Kurama Tengu, and it starred uh, Kon Omura, whom you might uh, recognize from the Gamera movies. But this wasn't actually Toho's first attempt at doing anything on television, because in 1958, they were actually contacted by an American TV station to create a four-part miniseries that was going to be a giant monster thing. Uh, that wound up becoming Varan the Unbelievable when the funding fell through. But basically, that's why Varan is feels like a step down. It feels like something that was made for television as opposed to, you know, the Mysterians and Rodan that came earlier. Uh, you can see kind of a partial recreation of this uh, on the Media Blasters DVD, but it's not exactly what it would have been if it had actually gone to TV. Uh, so while we're on the topic of giant monster TV miniseries, uh, another interesting thing that was not actually made by Toho is uh, Agon the Atomic Dragon. And this is something that Toho did not make, uh, but some people who worked from Toho worked on it, uh, namely uh, Shinichi Sekizawa, the uh, great screenwriter and um, effects guy Fuminori Ohashi. Uh, Sekizawa was under a non-compete at the time, though, and Toho was like, this is too similar to Godzilla. We are going to bury this project. So it didn't go to a full series. There were only four episodes that were made. And even though it was made in 1964, it didn't actually make it onto TV until 1968. 
By the time it did, the monster suit had already been reused for space giants, and it would have seemed really, really ridiculous because there was this this whole kaiju boom and so much stuff had come between. It would have been quaint to have this like black and white program in 1968, even though it was four years later. Uh, ironically, Toho wound up distributing the uh, series on video down the road. So we mentioned the uh, the kaiju boom just now. And uh, this was a period where I'm sure a lot of people know in the theaters in Japan, you had all sorts of uh, Gamera, Gappa, Gilala, Godzilla, uh, Kaiju, all the studios were making giant monster movies. And this was also true on television. Now, again, Toei is making most of the stuff, as you can see here. But you also had uh, P Productions. Nissan got in really early with uh, Marine Kong. Uh, Tatsunoko and Senkosha were also working on stuff. But you might be thinking, well, I mean, the people that make all the stuff is Toho. They're the, they're the Godzilla people. Why are they not making TV shows? And the answer to that comes in the form of Tsuburaya Productions because Toho's go-to effects guy was Eiji Tsuburaya. And in 1963, he went off and he formed his own company, Tsuburaya Productions. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, why isn't Toho upset about their guy? Like, kind of going behind their back and no Toho was you know they had buy-in from from day one uh a lot of the Super Eye production shows were filmed on Toho lots a lot of Toho staff including even you know Ishiro Honda worked on Return of Ultraman episodes um a lot of the actors are the same between the two uh they have sort of a, a long complicated history basically after uh after Ultra 7 um Toho really amped it up and they bought a controlling interest of Super Eye Productions and they continue to have it as a subsidi of subsidiary way up until the 90s. Uh, but uh, it wasn't a great relationship. Uh, Super Eye had some debts to pay off to Toho over time. Toho made a bunch of cutbacks. They got rid of the literary department, uh, including Tetsuo Kinjo, the great Ultraman writer. Um, the staff went from 150 people down to 40. Uh, so it was it was a little bit tenuous at times, especially after the death of, of Tsuburaya when Toho really wanted to, to take a more hands-on approach. Um, that said, Toho was distributing Tsuburaya's work theatrically uh, almost up until the 80s, and they uh, they co-produced Daigoro versus Goliath together. So they, they had a, a good working relationship to some extent. And if you are a fan of Toho Kaiju, you can see a whole lot of them show up in Tsuburaya shows especially early on so ultra q here are just a handful of examples and you know the the famous go-to is the the kaiju baragon from uh 1965 was then reused as four different monster suits before being returned to uh the toho lots for destroy all monsters in 1968 so that suit took a lot of harassment so tldr basically toho and ultraman have a kind of complicated relationship and when people ask so did the people who made Godzilla also make Ultraman? You can be, yes, no, kind of, sort of. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that's going to continue to be the case to some extent in the future because we also have Shane Ultraman, which Toho is uh, producing. Uh, but it's very much a Tsuburaya Productions property. That said, uh, another work that's a Tsuburaya Productions property that Toho has a full producer production credit on. It's not just a, this was filmed on Toho Lots. This has, uh, you know, Toho Sound people working on it. No, uh, Kaiju Busca from 1968, if you look at the copyright information from when it was made, it has Tsuburaya and Toho and Nippon Television all credited equally. Uh, this is a, you know, little sitcom about a monster who goes on everyday life adventures. Uh, he's a cute thing that you probably have seen around if you've been in the kaiju fandom for quite a while, he likes to eat ramen, so on and so forth. Uh, first appearance of a, of a Toho kaiju on television properly is in He of the Sun, which was Toho's first uh, in-house made uh, TV color drama, uh, which ran in 1967. And it's basically about a reporter who goes around Tokyo and meets interesting people. The second episode is of particular note because it features Haru Nakajima in his uh, in his Gaira outfit, and uh, it also features the boxer Benke Fujikura, and the two of them actually get into a boxing uh, match in the Gaira suit. 
Um, unfortunately, this episode is not available on DVD anywhere, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, Toho wanted to make a uh, Godzilla TV series in the same line of the King Kong show because, you know, they had uh, the King Kong show was made at Toei from rank uh, was a collaboration with Rankin Bass and it uh, resulted in the movie King Kong Escapes. So they kind of had something similar in mind to uh, co-produce something with Filmation in uh, 1968, which made sense because Destroyer Monsters was supposed to be the end of the Godzilla series. And they were kind of thinking about new ways to uh, branch out and do different things for the Champion Festival. But alas, it did not come to pass. So not a whole lot more to say about that. But it's kind of one of those interesting lost projects. And speaking of stuff that's lost, there's a show uh, that ran entirely uh, called a Chibiko Special. And it was a local children's show in the Kanto area. So just the area around Tokyo. And as a result of it just being a local show, uh, there's not a whole lot of documentation in magazines because magazines were printed on a national level. Uh, but this show had its own kaiju mascot who was a, an ancient god from uh, Peru uh, and is called Terra Incognita. And he showed up on a whole bunch of these shows and none of them are available. This show is completely lost uh, and there's not a whole lot of information about it. So an, an author named Rachel Ricardo really uh, started off this movement to find information about this show. Uh, <laughs> in uh, 2003 and he, he did the whole story as a manga and it's really interesting to just kind of see how this this obscure thing that he kind of remembered from 30 years ago has really been revived and you can find terra incognita merchandise even though you can't find the show itself so you might notice uh, in one of these photos that uh, terra incognita is squaring off against the kaiju gabara and sure enough a lot of toho monsters show up on chibiko special uh, including Godzilla, Gabra, Gigan, Ghidra, and Mothra. Uh, a lot of original monsters were introduced for the show, including uh, Shilarji, Yasugan, and the uh, Tsunojiras, and those were all reused later in Go Godman, which we'll get to a little down the road. Uh, a piece of trivia that I find really amazing is that uh, Chibiko Special also had a character called Mechani Godzilla. This was a couple of years before Mechagodzilla in the movies, uh, that there is this idea that Godzilla has a robotic counterpart. And um, again, there's no photos of this uh, around, but it was one of those things that was kind of recreated uh, in illustrations during this uh, guy's research from witness accounts. So along the lines of weird introductions and things that are lost, another show we don't have broadcast for anymore is uh, Katsura Kojiki's uh, Kokinji's afternoon show. And on that, there was a results of a contest. Basically, Toho and Tsuburai got together for something called Chibiko Kaiju Daigaku, which is Children's Monster University. And it's a contest where kids would design their own monsters and the winner would go on to uh, have their monster featured in a Godzilla movie. So a whole bunch of contestants all showed up on the show and they unveiled this winning monster design, uh, Red Alone. And the winning designer actually uh, hated it because it didn't look like his original drawing at all. But uh, this character showed up on uh, several shows uh, and um, went to department stores to do pr uh, promotions and stuff like that. And basically was kind of a little bit of a, of a a promotional icon until it was basically retooled and done as done over again as a character called Jet Jaguar for the uh, movie Godzilla vs. Megalon. So why would they have taken this design and completely redone it? Well, there is this whole movement in the early 70s when giant robots and transforming superheroes got really popular. So the, the superhero thing was called the Henshin Boom. So a little bit of a, of a background on this. Uh, this is a result of when uh, Return of Ultraman came on TV in 1971. And then to compete with it, a bunch of other shows came out, including this Toei show called Kamen Rider, which features a very imitable karate bug man who shouts out his attack names and does fancy transformation poses and is a big hit with the kids. So uh, because of that, you get a whole glut. Uh, so as my example here, in, in 1972 alone, uh, we have Ultraman Ace, uh, Arashi, Lion Maru, Barum One, Thunder Mask, 
Devil Man, Kikaider, Iron King, Triple Fighter, and Gatchaman. That's all in one year. So no matter where you look on TV, all of a sudden there are superheroes. Uh, one such superhero show is this uh, program called Assault Human. Uh, this was made by Nippon Television, uh, has uh, designs by uh, Ultraman's Tol Narita. And this was a, a stage show that was done at community centers. Again, the show is completely lost now. All we have left of it is uh, an eight millimeter film video, but a bunch of these monsters that Narita designed for this show are reused the next year in a Toho program called Go Green Man. So we've mentioned God Man and Green Man at this point, but we can really dive into it here. These were shorts. These were done uh, as five minute shorts as part of uh, uh, the Good Morning Kids show. And God Man is really picking up where uh, Tsuburaya had an earlier show called Red Man. So God Man and Red Man are very similar that they're five minute shorts where a guy is out in the wilderness. There's not really props or sets or plot. He's just fighting monsters for five minutes. So uh, it's it's very cheaply done, but uh, you know, Toho's uh, Tezo Toshimitsu, who had the long history on the, the proper movies was working on the show, uh, even though it was very like low budget and um, not very substantial. So Godman was enough of a success that it was kind of continued the next year with Green Man. Uh, so, you know, we had Red Man before, now we have Green Man, but it's sort of a double pun because the host of the Good Morning Show was uh, Midori Ibina, Ebina, and uh, Midori is green in Japanese, so it's kind of a ha 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 ha. Um, and Green Man kind of picks up the pace a little bit in that all of a sudden there's dialogue and recurring characters and things that you would normally associate with the show unless you're, you know, looking at something like Red Man. So uh, this makes things a little bit more complex, but again, a lot of those repeated villains that we had talked about prior. Those aren't the only familiar faces that you'll see on those shows though, because a lot of the Toho Kaiju suddenly are being reused as you know enemies of the week on God Man and Green Man. And these suits tend to be looking pretty rough by the time that they get on the air here, but uh, it's... Uh, it's pretty entertaining, you know, to see uh, Manila fighting as uh, the superhero and giant gorilla who is not King Kong for legal reasons. Uh, there's one more show that's in the God Man, Green Man uh, mold as part of the, the Good Morning Kid show, and that one is called uh, uh, Kotaro Ushiwaka. And um, this is a, a different thing. It's not a giant superhero. It's more of a ninja guy, and he has a, a sidekick that's an ogre and a, one that's a fox, and they basically fight yokai. And it seems like it's a period piece because they like use Ryo as the currency and talk all old samurai timesy. But then they'll like just walk around modern Shinjuku and take the subway and go to amusement parks. So it's very confusing. But uh, this sort of trilogy is uh, kind of. Uh, getting a little bit of a, a revival in, in Japan right now uh, because it's they're all kind of cheap and weird and, and fun to watch. Uh, Toho, in honesty, got into the superhero game also in 1972 with uh, Warrior of Love R Rainbow Man. So yeah, that's a, that's a loaded title and now nowadays. But um, this is created by Kohan Kawauchi who uh, created Moonlight Mask, as you remember for, for uh, Toei, the first TV superhero. Um, and uh, this had effects by Tsuburaya's protege, uh, Sadamasa Arikawa. Apparently they butted heads a bit on the set where uh, Kawauchi wasn't really happy with the way the effects were going on, on Toho. And he's like, well, can we do this differently? And yada, yada, yada. Um, but basically this is a, a superhero who has, you know, seven different forms, one for each day of the week or color of the rainbow, our element in the elemental system. Um, and he's fighting against a group of bad guys led by Akihiko Kurata, you know, Sarazawa from the original Godzilla. Um, the bad guys are a little problematic because their whole like motivation is that they were people who were wronged by Japan in World War II and are out for revenge. <laughs> so uh, they kind of like retcon that as the show goes along, but as a, as a modern viewer, you might view it and just go, I don't know about that. Uh, so Rainbow Man is iconic. You'll see little references to it here and there. Um, it was remade in the eighties as a mecha show. There was a manga by uh, the author of uh, Touch and Cross Game, uh, Mitsuro Dachi. Um, 
And also, most importantly, this hero who has all of these multiple forms was a big influence on Go Nagai when he was creating his own character, Cutie Honey, which sort of kicked off this whole boom of what we call magical girl superheroes. So uh, this was actually the first of a trilogy that uh, Kawauchi worked on at the time. Uh, the second one was uh, Diamond Eye, uh, which is really about this like magic spirit who is um, fighting diamond <laughs> diamond thieves who are actually demons. It's it's a little bit complicated, but um, this was the the second one that was made at Toho, and the last of the three was made at Toho. Uh, for the last part of this, you know, uh, Kawauchi trilogy, uh, Condor Man he went back to uh, to Toe to make it. So uh, take from that what you will. Now we get to perhaps Toho's most famous superhero, especially from the 1970s, is Zone Fighter from Meteor Man Zone. This takes a whole bunch of uh, things that would seem familiar from other shows. Um, you know, the hero is uh, an alien from the land of uh, peace, as opposed to the land of light where Ultraman comes from. And uh, he uh, he has this, this human form that uh, he, he and his siblings can, can fight together. Uh, and uh, then he grows into a giant form uh, to fight giant monsters, and uh, you can kind of see, okay, well, this is from this is from Ultraman, this is from Kamen Rider, this is from Gatchaman. But as a as a fan of Toho stuff, it's really fantastic to to view because um, you have uh, your star is uh, Kazuya Aoyama, who you know as the star of Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla. Uh, the effects are done by Koichi Kawakita and Teru, Noshi, Teru Yoshinakano. And then uh, as far as directors go, you have six episodes directed by Yoshiro Honda, six episodes directed by Jun Fukuda, and then three by uh, Kohei Ogure. Uh, so this is, you know, the only time that somebody who's won an Oscar in the U.S. is directing Godzilla stuff. Oh, did I say Godzilla stuff? Yeah, by the way, Zone Fighter is basically a 1970s Godzilla movie because Godzilla shows up in five episodes. King Ghidra shows up in three episodes. Uh, Gigan shows up in an episode. And it's this great combination of classic Godzilla kaiju stuff along with these original weird monsters uh, that Keizo Murase was building. And it's, it's fantastic. If you're a fan of 70s Godzilla, this is absolutely something you should not miss out on. Uh, and it's all fan sub now, so you can watch it and just kind of get a sense of, this is this is the missing piece of that whole champion Matsuri Godzilla era. Uh, moving right along, uh, another iconic show from the 1970s that's kind of had a little bit of a renaissance nowadays is uh, Kuri Kuri Takara, or Gimme Gimme Octopus. Uh, so, Takara is uh, another one of those five minute uh, short uh, shows. Uh, and it's just about this, this octopus who has come up and lives on land due to pollution. And it's a slapstick comedy. He's, he's really avarice. He's always you know running around. His, his catchphrase is gimme gimme, hence the, the title. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's zany. Uh, what's wild about this is that there are uh, a handful of uh, of important uh, folks who have worked on it. Um, Tom Kotani, I'm a big fan of uh, The Last Dinosaur, so I, I'd love to see anything that he's worked on. Shusuke, uh, uh, Shunsuke Kikuchi, uh, who, you know, did the soundtracks to the later Gamera Showa movies and, and Dragon Ball, and Keizo Murase, the suit maker, all worked on this. Um, there are three episodes of the show that are completely lost, however, and then there's one that's uh, that's only available censored because uh, of uh, he. <laughs> there's an episode where the uh, where Takara is going around cutting people down with a sword, and he uses a slur for the mentally ill, and that was bleeped out for the DVD release. So to give you an idea of how kind of wild the show is by uh, uh, modern standards, uh, that could give you a bet bit of sense. And like I said, Takara is kind of getting a lot of, uh, of merchandise nowadays. So you can find figures and things of him and I, I you know, go to the Godzilla store and see him on t-shirts and, and magazines and stuff like that. So if you see this, this goofy looking character, know that there is a, there is a, a Toho Godzilla connection uh, behind that. Moving right along. Uh, 
a couple of other shows that are not quite as hero related. Uh, there's a uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Um, this one was actually made in 1969, but didn't make it to air until 1973. Basically, they thought, mm, you know, a show that's based on a British novel, like are people actually going to be interested in this? Uh, it's a shame that it didn't do that great when it uh, when it first came out, because, you know, it's got Tetsuro Tamba as a lead actor, is directed by Hideo Gosha, music by Masaru Sato, and uh, the first acting appearance of uh, Daisuke Ban, you know, uh, Kikaira and um, Inazuman and stuff like that. Uh, it's got a really like psychedelic feel to it. Uh, and, you know, the music's great. It's got a lot of extreme content for the 60s, extreme content for the 70s in terms of, you know, violence and sex scenes and things like that. So it was aired late at night when it finally did make it to television. <laughs> Uh, another effects drama is uh, Japan Sinks. You know, the Submersion of Japan movie came out in theaters and um, it was a huge, huge, huge success in 1973. And they just decided, okay, well, let's also do it as a TV show. And basically the idea here is tune in this week to see your local neighborhood in Japan sink and be destroyed and fall underwater. <laughs> so uh, the story is a little different from the movie, obviously, uh, because it's uh, more serialized uh, and it has, you know, different actors in, in the lead roles, but brand new special effects sequences by uh, Koichi Takano and uh, Koichi Kawakita. Jun Fukuda did the first and last episodes. And, uh, you know, just a few of the actors that we'll see in it are Kenji Sahara, Yoshio Tsuchiya, Miehama, Machiko Soga, and uh, Yu Fujiki. So it's uh, a pretty star-studded cast, even though even the author of Japan Sinks um, did not actually care for this TV show when it was when it was airing. But then again, he had uh, he had Time of the Apes on another channel at the same time, so he could be picky, I guess. Uh, the uh, the the hero boom is kind of you know slowing down a little bit in Japan towards the towards the mid seventies, but it's still going on. Uh, and there's a show that Toei introduces called uh, the Five Rangers, Go Ranger. And uh, in response to this, and also a, a boom in UFOs, Toho makes their own show with uh, a handful of other people, but it's literally a handful. Uh, they had a an effects crew of of just uh, three for the show. So it's not that well regarded because of that, even though, again, Tol Narita was doing alien designs for it. Um, it is it is available on DVD, but people don't really particularly talk about it and kind of see it as a as a knockoff of those Super Sentai programs. What does have a bit of a following is Monkey. I'm sure if you are from Australia of a certain age set, you will remember this one that uh, born from an egg on the mountaintop, the funkiest monkey who ever popped. He learned every magic trick under the sun to fool with the gods and everyone. Uh, yeah, so um, this program uh, was not directly made by Toho. Uh, it was made by Nippon Television, but the first season special effects were done by Tsuburaya. Second season effects were done by Toho. Uh, Jun Fukuda worked on 11 episodes across both of the seasons. Uh, Teriyoshi Nakano and Koichi Kawakita from Toho directed effects for it. There's lots of big monster things that go on in it. Uh, and it's, you know, basically an adaptation of Journey to the West, the classic Chinese novel. But it takes some liberties. It makes things more adventurous. It's got some monsters of the week. I would recommend checking it out. The series is available dubbed in the UK from, from BBC. That's how it became such a big hit around the world. Uh, it's also available in Australia. And Australia actually has a new show you can see on Netflix right now that is a remake of it. Unfortunately, not so much with the giant monsters. So... Uh, sort of a sort of a bummer there. Now we get to uh, the the last superhero show of the 1970s from from Toho. Is this is uh, Megaloman? This was actually not originally supposed to be a Toho program. It was uh, supposed to be made at P Productions. So the hero kind of looks like uh, Ambassador Magma or, or Goldar from Space Giants, where he has the the long hair. Uh, this was uh, this was Yak Hair, uh, the, and uh, Shinichi Wakasa, who is part of this very convention, uh, worked on on that. Um, so uh, this is uh, of of interest to Ultraman fans, you know, kind of being an Ultraman knockoff. Ultraman Star Susumu uh, Susumu Kurobe appears in eleven episodes of it, and um, 
Koichi Takano uh, did a lot of the special effects. Koichi Kawakita did one episode. He built this huge volcano set piece, went way over budget, and was not invited back to do any more episodes of Megaloman. Uh, really quickly, Megaloman was a bit of a, a, a pop culture phenomena at the time. Uh, so uh, as such, there was this uh, big crossover quiz show that was done in the late 70s where Megaloman appeared aside uh, Godzilla, Rodan, Mothra, Ghidra, Gamera, Gauss, Daimajin, and Ultraman. Uh, and uh, it was hosted by Tadao Takashima. I can't find any clips or stills or anything from this program, so I don't know to what extent these things all came together. Uh, it seems definitely wild that this was, this was a thing that's not sort of known about, but it was a one-time broadcast and it's not clear exactly the format aside from that it was sort of a, a competitive show to find out who was the, the doctor monster expert. Now, a uh, guest appearance that I was able to track down is on uh, the Hiroshi Ogawa show. And this is one where they did interviews with the monster design team, but then uh, Megaloman and Ultraman, uh, they show up together and they, they team up and they, they fight some monsters uh, for just a short little segment, but it's really cool to get this as a, an official crossover. Uh, continuing along uh, a similar line, uh, we had this uh, this NHK special called Birth of Godzilla, um, Aged Tsuburaya. So it was really a uh, supposed to be for one decade since Tsuburaya passed. And uh, they were interviewing a bunch of people that worked with him. And towards the end, they had this little demonstration where they brought out a Godzilla suit and a couple of, uh, of Ultraman suits. And they just kind of had them walk around. So that's a, a fun little uh, nugget of uh, information as well. But Toho's big production in 1980 was Tokyo Earthquake Magnitude 8.1. So uh, this is starring Sonny Chiba. This is a TV movie, and it's about um, basically a, a huge earthquake and uh, disasters and and a whole lot of, uh, of you know human drama around it. So, you know, if you like Shin Godzilla, this might appeal on a similar level because it's also a disaster movie. Uh, this was done by uh, director uh, Kiyoshi Nishimura, who had previously worked on the Japan Sinks TV series. And um, Koichi Kawakita did the special effects. He had a huge budget of 30 million yen to work with and did all new footage. I uh, did lots of pyrotechnics, water effects, um, high speed photography. And when Tomoyuki Tanaka took a look at the footage. He was like, hey, stop reusing footage from the Japan Sinks movie. And he's like, no, 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 this is real footage. I just shot it, this is new. And that shows just how good it was. In fact, this footage was so good that they reused it in movies down the road, including in Return of Godzilla. So the staff that worked on this immediately got to work on the theatrical film Deathquake. So that's really how these pieces come together. Uh, really quickly, a couple of uh, little things that happened throughout the 70s and, and 80s. Um, Manga Stories was a puppet show that was filmed at Toho, uh, sort of live action uh, and animation segments that were educational. Some Japanese people might remember this if they were children at that time. There was a program called uh, Forbidden Mariko in 1985. Uh, th this was part of a, an ESP boom in the 80s. Uh, Psychics and ESP powers were really popular. Uh, Toho was making a show at the same time called Kamagura Orange Road that was an anime that was about psychics. Uh, so it was just kind of on everybody's mind. So this is uh, a, a mystery where a girl uses her powers and uh, is kind of looking into her father's past and stuff like this. Uh, the show was taken off the air because um, shortly after it, it wrapped, um, the lead actress who was an idol committed suicide. Um, unfortunately, idol life can be difficult sometimes. Uh, and as a result, it was kind of scandal and uh, the, the show itself has gotten relatively buried. Uh, the one 80s uh, superhero show that came out of uh, Toho is called Cyber Cop. Uh, and this is set in the far future year of 1999 and has a, a bunch of, uh, you know, policemen, they're all themed around planets. So it's kind of like a precursor to Sailor Moon in a way. 
Um, and this was a this was a Takara uh, joint where you know they were kind of making the the toys and trying to promote them. Uh, the toys did not sell very well at first until they were actually featured on a completely different TV drama uh, that was not a special effects thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden the toys sold very well. But a lot of interesting stuff has come out of CyberCop. Uh, they wanted to do a sequel that was not actually it didn't come to fruition uh, called Cyberman. But they they stuck with that concept and went to Tsuburaya, and eventually that resulted in the creation of Grade Man. Another canceled sequel became the anime uh, Metal Jack, and uh, the show did uh, get some international distribution. It uh, it aired in Brazil, and then after afterwards the costumes were all actually sold to a circus in Brazil, and they were used for stage shows there. Uh, when the Power Rangers boom hit in the in the early nineties, they tried to uh, localize. Cybercop for the states uh, as Zap Power Force. Uh, it didn't go very far in the actual TV market uh, in terms of filming or anything, but the toys were all brought over. So you can find Cybercop toys in uh, American toy stores, you know, buried under tons of dust to this day. Moving along to the 90s, one thing that is not Officially, uh, Tokusatsu uh, is uh, Nadia: The Secret of Blue Water. So this was a co-production between Toho and Gainax, uh, and it's based on uh, Jules Verne's uh, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, based on a concept by Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, why do we care? So Shinji Higuchi directed the back half of this series. Uh, the show overall was directed by Hideaki Anno of, of Shin Godzilla, and uh, the music was done by uh, Shiro Sagisu, including that iconic riff that don, 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 that you hear in Shin Godzilla, that people say come, came from Evangelion, but before Evangelion, it was used in this. Uh, and, you know, the, the premise of this is that it's based on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but it's also, you know, a guy with a flying submarine fighting against the Neo Atlantis Empire. And you might be saying, hey, that sort of sounds like a Toho movie. And turns out, there is a whole lot of stuff that is sort of taken from uh, Tokusatsu uh, because of Higuchi and Ano's interests in it. So, you know, especially the um, Otragon, uh, Latitude Zero, War in Space, uh, all of all of that set, you'll see uh, familiar imagery going going around in these episodes. So, I would recommend checking it out, even though it is not Tokusatsu. It's anime. I felt compelled to bring it up. But let's just talk about some some animated stuff a little bit more. Uh, a lot of people know about the OVA uh, Godzilland. Uh, not as many people know that before it was an original animated video, there was a TV series. There were in fact two different TV series that aired in 92 and 93. Uh, and those were both promotional things for the movies at the time, one for Godzilla versus Mothra and one for Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. Uh, and they're basically variety shows. So they have some parts that are animated, some parts that are live action, uh, dance alongs, things like that. Uh, there's one episode of this that is available. Uh, and I was a little surprised to see uh, that the opening theme is Chala Head Chala from Dragon Ball Z, uh, which was you know the biggest anime ever at the time and probably still is. <laughs> Uh, and I have not seen anybody else call this out or mention this, and it's not listed in the credits. And I kind of wonder how that came about. Uh, the creator of Dragon Ball is a big Godzilla fan, but uh, still has to have to kind of wonder because that was a Toei show and this is a Toho show. Why are they using the same theme song? Um, these shows are uh, of some interest also because uh, the very first appearance of the Heisei Mecha Godzilla and Baby Godzilla suits, uh, they appear on the show months before the movies actually came out. And the uh, the, the Cosmos and uh, Godzilla versus Mothra also make their appearance here. One last anime, I promise. Uh, Yamato Takeru. Um, this is part of a multimedia campaign. So you had the movie Orochi the, Three -headed, uh, Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon that came out in 1994. That was sort of Toho's big special effects movie of the year. And you also have this anime that came out in 1994, and a lot of people say, oh, this is a knockoff or it's just a coincidence. And no, this was part of a multimedia campaign. So there was a manga and the movie and the anime all came out at the same time to try to appeal to different markets. This is a very common technique that they use 
in Japan to have one bring up hype for the other. That said, this is not very similar to the movie. It's uh, it's very you could say it's it's a loose adaptation. Um, it's set in the future. It's on an alien planet, but it does have you know the general premise of there's a giant robot and it is based on Japanese mythology. Uh, and it has the same theme to the uh, TV show. The opening credits music is the same as the closing credits music in the movie, or it was at first. Uh, 18 episodes in, the uh, when you know when the movie came out and it didn't do that well, they changed the opening theme, <laughs> and the opening theme is not available on the DVD releases anymore. So it's uh, it's kind of uh, awkward there. This was originally intended for 52 episodes, but they cut it down to 37 because the movie didn't do very well. Uh, but they did manage to wrap up the story with a with a direct video uh, sequel. Guyford, I love Guyford. Guyford is my jam. This is of all of the the Toho shows I would love to see come to the states officially. Guyford is is the one. Maybe this is just because I was a, a small child in the time when it came out, but this is a this is a Capcom uh, project. It was originally intended as a video game, but it was made as a as a live action show by Toho, and it's kind of riffing on the Giver and Fist of the North Star. It's not as violent as either of those, but it's this uh, this bio organic uh, transforming hero who uses uh, martial arts. He doesn't have any weapons or anything. He just uses the the power of Chinese kung fu to beat up monsters. Uh, it was written by Sho Aikawa, who went on to a very prolific career. Uh, and Fuyuki Shinada uh, did the the monster suits. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. I would recommend checking it out. It's got that that very 90s uh, aesthetic uh, right around the same time as you know um, the source material for Beetleborgs was being made, for an example. Uh, but if you're a fan of Giver, check it out. Uh, getting back to Godzilla stuff, uh, there were a couple of short shows, uh, you know, five-minute episode things that were on TV in the uh, late 90s. Um, there was Godzilla Kingdom, which was uh, two animated characters would watch clips from uh, the Godzilla movies and sort of comment on them. Uh, this had the opening theme, Rhythm Generation, from 2Mix, which a lot of people assume is from Gundam Wing, but it was not actually part of that... Uh, part of the Gundam Wing uh, set. It's just the same band. So it's kind of interesting that they managed to get that score. Um, and also uh, Godzilla TV, which was a, sort of like every day of the week, they would have a different focus where it would be like a set visit or Godzilla 2000 news or something like that. So it was really, again, something that was driving up hype for the upcoming movie. But my favorite of all the Godzilla uh, five minute programs is Godzilla Island. Uh, a lot of people know this because it resulted in a, in a toy line. Uh, in fact, it was depicted by a toy line. All of the monsters are depicted by toys in this series. Uh, this is, this is a wild one. Um, it's, it's set a hundred years in the future and it's on monster Island and planet X invades and, um, it's up to the earth monsters to defend it. You've got uh, several actors that you would find familiar. Uh, Girardin uh, from Return of Ultraman, Kari Aso from B Fighter Kabuto, and Dogura, the space blob monster, is actually voiced by Kape Yamaguchi. So yes, the voice of Inuyasha provides the voice of Dogura in this. Uh, this was co-produced with Subaraya Entertainment. It's a different company from Subaraya Productions. Um, and uh, I gotta stress, uh, Godzilla Island, like, you sit, you hear, oh, these are all like Bondi action figures. And that's true, but that doesn't even start to scratch the surface of how weird the show is. There's, you know, original monsters like the hyper mecha King Ghidorah that they, the aliens get this from a giant vending machine that's floating in space. Uh, there's a Monster Island dance party. There's Jet Jaguar as a nurse and a firefighter. Um, it's it's just a, a really wild ride, and they do lots of, of strange, uh, kooky things throughout this series that you would not expect the Godzilla franchise to, to necessarily do. And um, there are 
raws of it out there uh, on the Godzilla YouTube channel. They were they were posting an, an episode a week for a long period of time. I'm not sure how many of those are still up. Um, but uh, if you are if you are a hardcore Godzilla fan or a fan of just things that are really really weird, check out Godzilla Island. Another uh, project that was a uh, Toho and uh, Tsuburaya Entertainment, just because we just brought them up, is Starbos. Um, this was a short 13 episode thing. It was a parody of Star Wars. It was done for Agent Tsuburaya's 100th birthday. And basically the idea is that you have these, these guys that they would be like the stormtroopers. They're the, they're the members of this galactic empire. They're low level foot soldiers, uh, but it's kind of a comedic take on them. So um, uh, it's really difficult to, to find uh, copies of this nowadays. It's long out of print, but uh if, if you search for it now, you're most likely to find, uh, re because it was referenced in uh, the recent SSSS.gridman, uh, people talking about that. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, the 1990s also had a big boom in horror movies, and that continued into the 2000s. Now, the big obvious go-to why that would be is The Ring, but uh, another potential uh, source of this is the Gakko no Kaidan series. Uh, School of Ghosts, and this there was a series of four movies that was made by Toho, but also there was a non-Toho version that was made for television in, in Osaka. Um, Toho did distribute uh, some of it on uh, on home video, but uh, other ones were distributed by Pony Canyon and Dae, so it wasn't you know a strong Toho connection here. Um, but the series is significant in that it, uh, it resulted in the creation of The Grudge because one of the segments, this was an anthology show, and one of the segments was remade as, uh, as a grudge. Uh, but also, uh, one of the segments was directed by Michio Yamamoto and written by Fumio Tanaka of the Bloodthirsty Trilogy. And in interviews, they said, yeah, we just made another installment of the Bloodthirsty Trilogy for this anthology. <laughs> so if you are a fan of those... Uh, vampire movies from the 70s uh you can find uh you can find this uh segment and it's it's really stunning because it's the same you know pasty faced turtleneck wearing vampire character that you uh you know and love moving right along uh keeping on that horror uh vampire front uh toho made a tv series in 2004 called the vampire gigolo or vampire host uh, this is based on a manga by Karayuki, who also did Angel Sanctuary, if you're a girl who grew up in the 90s reading manga. And uh, this is kind of a, a riff on a, a very popular Toho series called Trick. So, so Trick, the idea is that you had a physicist and a magician, and they go around sort of debunking people who are making magical claims. Uh, and one of the directors of Trick was the director for this. And... Um, this is similar, except it's one of the two characters is an actual vampire, and they go around debunking witches and werewolves and things that are uh, are, are monsters, basically. And they're looking for real monsters. So uh, Tomo Haraguchi uh, did work on the Gamera trilogy and um, Sakuya and Kibakichi, etc. worked on this. The show is available on DVD in the States, so I'd say, yeah, maybe check it out. Uh, they kept going in the same block of, of television programming time. Um, after after uh, Vampire Host ended, Toho had a show called Phantasma. The show was also all out in the States. I've watched it all. I don't really remember anything about it. Can't really recommend it that much. So we can move right along. <clears throat> this brings us to the last show of that sort of uh, horror oeuvre, and it is The Greatest. This is uh, The Great Horror Family, which is a sitcom by the creator of The Grudge about a family that lives in a grudge house. So uh, it's it's really goofy because as they live in this house, there are first ghosts show up and then yokai show up and then aliens show up and men in black show up and exorcists show up and it just gets crazier and crazier as things move right along. Uh, you might recognize the main star of this was from, uh, from Shin Godzilla. Uh, he was the very... Uh, enthusiastic guy that you know starts uh, starts shouting when he finds a finds a pattern and then apologizes for it. And uh, in one of the episodes, the suit that was later used in Death Kappa, the Kappa costume, uh, shows up in this. 
Uh, this is also available on DVD in the States. I would highly suggest checking it down. Uh, really quickly, uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time here, but uh, in 2003, we had sort of a renaissance of tokusatsu programs on television uh, brought about by, you know, well-regarded, critically acclaimed things like uh, Decker Ranger and Ultraman Nexus and um, and the Common Rider Kuga revival and things like that. Um, so all in this time, there's, there's, uh, there's more interest that's being brought up for... Uh, for Tokusatsu and and Toho, uh, they they get together, um, and and work with Konami, and they bring about this trilogy called the uh, the Ultra Star God trilogy, uh, and this runs from two thousand three until two thousand six, and they have three entries in this. Uh, the first, which I think is the best, is uh, Ultra Star God Grand Caesar, uh, and this is kind of kind of like a Super Sentai series, except instead of you know a team of five, it's four teams of three and they all sort of fight each other. And it's very sort of Saint Seiya like because they all have uh, astrological signs as their, as their sources of their power. Um, and, you know, uh, Shinji Nishikawa and Fuyuki Shinada work on this. Uh, but really this is a, this is a Koichi Kawakita, his, his big thing that he works on after uh, the Heisei Godzilla uh, franchise is, is he's working on these uh, Ultra Stargon shows. Uh, this was this actually has an English dub uh, because it aired in Singapore, so you might be able to track that down if you look really hard. It did get licensed for an Americanization sort of Power Ranger style back in the day, but um, nothing ever came of it. Um, the second show in this in this series is uh, uh, Gensei, Gensei Shin Justy Riser, and uh, this one is a little bit more comedic than. Uh, than Grand Caesar was, it reduces the cast. Instead of having 12 main characters, you have three main characters. Uh, they they have their you know giant robots. They fight more monsters of the week instead of fighting each other. So it's a little bit more uh, typified. And um, you know similar deal where dub of it available from Singapore, uh, and you can uh, you can check it out. And then the last of those shows is uh, Caesar X. So this. Uh, this sort of has a, a, a time travel plot where uh, basically people come back in time, sort of Terminator style to, to battle against villains that will in the future threaten humanity. But then there's a lot of convoluted stuff about, well, why are these aliens threatening humanity in the first place? And it's, it's a really neat premise. Um, and it does have some neat things. Um, one of, one of the characters not pictured here, but uh, one of the supporting characters is a, uh, Cesar Gordo, who is the first, uh, you know, Caucasian uh, character support in this sort of role. Although where you gain some representation, you lose some other representation because you don't really have any female characters in, in, in the show that are, you know, in the, in the hero roles. Um, there was a big crossover uh, directed by Kazuki Omori that uh, aired in theaters. So you'll see a lot of people reference the Cesar. If you search for Cesar X, you're more likely to find stuff for the Cesar X movie than the TV show because it's this big grand finale where Justy Riser, Grand Caesar, and Caesar X all team up to, to fight enemies. Uh, and if you are a fan of the Toho effects stuff, uh, you're going to see a lot to like and, and remember in these uh, this set of three shows. Um, you'll see, you know, that the military uses Mazer tanks. And uh, they they reuse the hangar from the uh, Tokyo SOS and uh, Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla for one of the robots that the military has built. Uh, Hiroshi Koizumi, you know, he he showed up in Tokyo SOS uh, as uh, as Chujo. He also makes an appearance in Grand Caesar playing the same character. Uh, I I did uh, ask about this uh, when. Um, Masaki Tezuka came to uh, to G Fest and he said basically that you know they Toho saw this as like the next big thing and they wanted to encourage it and you know provide any resources to kind of move it along as you know the the next possible thing and I think they saw that the writing was a little bit on the wall Godzilla wise but you know TV Tokusatsu you know Sentai especially with Power Rangers internationally would have been the way to go and they were kind of giving it their all. So you see a lot of uh, a lot of 
familiar props from all sorts of stuff, you know, deep cuts, you know, stuff from Bye Bye Jupiter and Lake of Illusion that hadn't been, they must have been sitting in the warehouse for years and years unused. And then, you know, in the movie, we have the, uh, the Gotengo from Otragon as well as a whole lot of familiar kaiju designs that aren't quite aren't quite the monsters that you would recognize from Godzilla but they're pretty dang close so if you're a fan uh you should you should you know maybe give this a give these shows a a shot sometime Kawakita did have one last uh production at Toho and it's a it's an absolute delight uh this is Kawaii Jenny and uh, this was a promotion for Jenny dolls, which are kind of like Barbie dolls. And, um, you know, it's it's done as a as a, a comedy. It's it's written by the same guy that wrote Car Ranger and Ronma One Half. And, uh, it, you know, like, a, like Powerpuff Girls, it has sort of two segments in each episode. Uh, and uh, it even aired on Cartoon Network in Japan. But, you know, this this show, you know, the, the main characters are all these Jenny dolls. The villains are these evil, like Nazi-esque teddy bears, and uh, and then you have your 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 puppet sequences that are kind of uh, the heroes, and then they they get into you know suitmation for these these fights against the the monsters. So if you like you know Howl from the in the Fog or, or Thunderbolt Fantasy, I think this would be kind of your jam. Uh, there is a three part uh, Attack on Titan uh, mini series that happened in between the two movies. Uh, this is uh, a bunch of side stories. There's not a whole lot of special effects, but I still think if you're a fan of those movies, you owe it to yourself to check them out. They flesh out the backstory of the characters that are in the movies, especially the, you know, kind of the standout stars that didn't really get to shine there. Um, this is available on DVD in Australia, but not in the US, unfortunately. Hopefully that uh, that changes at some point. And then uh, one one last show to discuss bringing us up to the current year as we round out the hour here is Gojiban. Uh, this is a Godzilla puppet show on YouTube. Basically, there was a, uh, a contest that uh, that was run by Toho for YouTube to make Godzilla shorts. And the the winners were this uh, atal Atelier uh, Kogane Mushi. And uh, they, they've even dubbed an episode into English, but they're not going to do any more because it was really, really difficult for them to do. <laughs> but th these shorts are adorable and really weird and, and, and all over the place. They have sort of different segments focusing on different characters and they're, they're pretty funny and, and, and wild. And this is, a, this is a studio that's really, they have a long history doing uh, Godzilla and, and other kaiju puppet shows in case you're not so familiar. But uh, on that note, I think we're just about out of time here. So, you know, we could we could keep going on forever, but uh, you know, alas, uh, I think we are we we don't have enough time to talk about all of the possible things, especially when people keep throwing stuff like this at us. So, um, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in. Uh, I have stuff around the internet, and you can check such stuff out. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, viewing our uh, viewing our program.